Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Network of European Museum Organizations webinar, Museum Action for Climate Empowerment. My name is Elizabeth, and I work for NEMO. As the network for museums in Europe, our main activities are advocating for museums at EU level, providing training opportunities, providing a platform for museums to exchange and learn from one another, and helping museums to cooperate across borders. We're looking forward to today's special webinar planned in line with the ongoing conference of parties ongoing in Egypt. Today's webinar will begin with an outline of NEMO's most recent survey and upcoming report on climate action, uh, where I will be sharing the preliminary findings of our upcoming report. And then after that, we will be hearing from Henry McGee of Curating Tomorrow, who will dive deeper into the opportunities in policy development and capacity for action in museums. So um, I am, as I just said, going to go over some of the preliminary findings um, of the survey that we've conducted over the past year. Uh, the report is not out yet, um, but these are our main findings and um, the recommendations that we are basing on them. Um, but before I dive into those findings and recommendations, I think it may be helpful to give a bit of perspective of where NEMO sees itself, um, where NEMO sees its role in addressing climate and museums. Uh, so NEMO believes in advocating for the instrumental role of museums in providing opportunities for decent work, poverty reduction, social resilience, gender equality, and other aspects relevant to the SDGs. Um, illustrating how museums and creative industries contribute to the realization of development targets by providing solutions in various contexts. Providing information about the different approaches that museums in Europe and around the world are taking to help make our world more sustainable. And uh, by encouraging cooperation between museums and other players to form alliances on behalf of all citizens. So this uh, survey um, is not our first engagement with the topic. Um, I would argue that um, Nemo's strategic focus has actually involved quite a few elements of the SDGs for quite some time. However, it wasn't until 2019 that it took a sharper focus for us with our European Museum Conference 2030, sharing recipes for a better future. Um, it was also at this conference that the Museums for Future initiative was launched, and um, we are still a member of that network as well as the Climate Heritage Network. We've taken part in Voices of Culture dialogues with the Commission on the topic. We are currently an EU Climate Pact ambassador. We've led workshops and webinars on the topic, inviting experts in. Um, and we've also collaborated and contributed with our members and partner networks on various events, for example, one that um, ended with the Bremerhaven Declaration. We maintain a page on our website with resources for the sector, and we also have the intention to soon submit to a self-evaluation of our office operations to make ourselves more sustainable. And then, of course, what I'm going to be discussing with you for the rest of the time, our most recent action, um, our 2022 Europe-wide survey on the status quo of museums facing the climate crisis. So the survey itself uh, saw almost 600 responses from 39 European countries. Uh, we opened it in April of um, this past year, and we focused on um, these topics listed here. Um, however, we did limit our focus within those topics to the ecological impact even though we realize that the true sustainable transition will require a much more holistic and intersectional approach, um, we did have to limit somewhat um, because we, of course, couldn't put a 500 page survey out to the sector. Um, yeah, but uh, from this point now, I am going to be sharing with you the preliminary findings, um, what we consider to be the main findings and the recommendations that we are basing off of those and putting towards policymakers and stakeholders at all levels. So we found um, that eight in 10 museums uh, state that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are reflected in the museum's strategic plans. Now, of course, um, this is something that we were happy to learn um, because uh, 
we do feel that that's one of the greatest opportunities for um, museums to contribute to the sustainable transition is, you know, their um, direct engagement with the public. And so the fact that this is already a priority is a great step in that direction. Um, However, we, um, we do also take it with a grain of salt because um, the narrative has very often been um, when it comes to culture and climate that um, you know, our cultural heritage and cultural heritage institutions are something simply to be you know, protected um, in, in the entire discussion and rightfully so, but we are not often enough considering how our cultural institutions can actually contribute towards, you know, creating solutions and supporting the sustainable transition. So with that in mind, um, we acknowledge and support the potential of museums um, as allies to help the public better understand climate change and to become more active. So, um, I should also perhaps mention that uh, this um, survey and report um, was also inspired by two surveys and reports that we did about the consequences of COVID-19 for the sector. And in that report, we did see, for example, when museums were increasing their digitalization efforts, they did not always have tools and measurements um, available to evaluate the success of those efforts. So we asked a similar question um, in this survey uh, about museums sustainability um, or development towards more sustainable operations. And we learned that one in four museums report that they work either with internal criteria or external assessment frameworks to measure their sustainable efforts. So to that, we recommend um, to ensure that guidelines, standards, and reporting requirements reflect all aspects of museum work and are aligned to support sustainable goals. Um, now, we, we say specifically alignment here because um, also reflecting on some of the recommendations that came out of our COVID report, um, we consider it very important to take into mind um, and reevaluate new measures of success for our museums um, when we're considering climate specifically and sustainability. Um, it's very important that the standards that we are holding our museums to um, are not then negating the requirements um, or the efforts that we're making to become more sustainable as a sector. So we learned um, that one in 10 museums are aware of local, regional, or national climate policies that feature or address them. Um, now, of course, there are many more opportunities um, for museums uh, to see themselves in these guidelines um, and recommendations being put forward. Uh, so we are recommending to increase communication between governing and funding bodies and museums, encouraging cooperation and um, to develop cohesive, comprehensive frameworks for museum work. Um, that element of cooperation and communication, um, I think, is going to be extremely important moving forward as we're going to have to be making changes. Um, and it will be very important that um, the real work of museums are reflected in those, uh, in those changes. Um, one, of the, one of the comments that we received from many museums after um, going through the survey was that many of uh, the intentions to make operations or, for example, the house more um, sustainable uh, that those decisions were oftentimes outside the um, authority of, of the museum professionals themselves. So um, that's why this policy coherence and cooperation is going to be so important. And that, of course, also relates directly to infrastructure and making, um, you know, making sustainable changes there as well. And I, on, I could have showed probably any of the graphs in our uh, infrastructure section, and it would have looked quite similar. Um, but I chose this one uh, that's two in 10 museums claim that they use a green energy supplier. And um, so here we are recommending to facilitate funds for investments in the infrastructure of museums so that buildings could be maintained in a more energy efficient, ecological and sustainable manner. And um, we, we discussed the funds here, of course, because um, this was one of the the most selected um, impediments to becoming more sustainable. Um, 
but then we also mentioned specifically that financial support should be streamlined and coupled with financial relief in consideration of the current energy crisis impacting museums across Europe. So we saw that less than one in 10 museums have completed an analysis about the challenges associated with climate change in their region. Um, this is, of course, concerning um, because, you know, as, as much as we encourage climate action um, and, you know, adaptation mitigation, um, we are certainly past the point of full stop prevention. So it is going to be important to um, make an analysis of um, the risks that we are likely to face and prepare for those. So um, we, our recommendation we're putting forward is to invest in future citizens sustain access to European shared heritage by funding and encouraging risk assessment, adaptation and mitigation for museums. And here we also speak directly to the sector with a call to action to ensure the safety of collections, premises and functioning of museums for future generations by analyzing the climate associated, associated risks applicable to them and their communities and consequently preparing for those risks. Under skills and training, we saw that two and three museums report that they do not have sufficient knowledge about the SDGs and climate action within their organization. So here we recommend to allocate financial support to upskill and train staff to contribute to the museum's sustainable transition and to support society's overall just transition. Once again, with a call to action to allow for internal and cross-departmental staff training according to the position, task, and field of action to facilitate change across museum departments. And then here, um, so this is the same graph that you just saw about the SDGs. Um, and I use this as the example here um, because we went and looked back at that question and quite a few others, but only taking into consideration the smaller subsect of museums answering the survey who also said that they were part of cultural networks that focus on climate change. And when we did that, um, then the numbers of uh, museum professionals who felt that their museum had sufficient knowledge about the SDGs increased quite a bit. Um, it actually pretty much doubled. Um, so I think this was um, quite an impact that we saw throughout. And um, therefore we make the recommendation to fund global cross-sector climate focused networks and umbrella organizations that address and enable mutual sharing of skills, knowledge and expertise, supporting and empowering the sector to address climate change. Um, we also have a call to action here to build alliances with other museums and cultural heritage organiza organizations, open doors to external expertise and work with researchers, local communities and stakeholders to ensure that the museum establishes an effective network to support the sustainable transition in Europe. Now, this finding, I think, um, is something that shares actually quite a bit of optimism. Um, I think it's something that speaks far beyond our sector as well, um, because, and, you know, I think it's also something that we can really take to heart because climate change and making the adjustments to society that are necessary is such a massive challenge. And um, personally, I find it somehow reassuring that potentially our greatest strength is actually our willingness to lean on each other and um, to be transparent and um, yeah, work together on this. Um, when we evaluated uh, the various responses and then compared for different sizes of museums, it did not make nearly as much of a difference as it did um, when we looked at the museums who are saying that they are working together in a network. So um, I think it's something we can be very optimistic about that our greatest strength is relying on one another. Um, yes, and uh, with that, I would also say that um, the final report is hopefully coming out this month. Um, so you will find all of those um, findings plus much more that I didn't have time to get into. Um, yeah. So thank you very much uh, for your attention to, uh, to our preliminary findings. Um, so towards the end of, uh, of this webinar session, we are going to be reserving a bit of time um, for questions and answers. 
Um, you can, of course, uh, put your questions in the chat as they come to you, either in regards to our survey um, or to the next ses uh, session of this webinar. Um, but I do want to start off just with a quick uh, feedback from you on these preliminary results. Um, so I would like to ask that uh, after hearing those results, um, do they resonate with you? You know, would you say that uh, these results actually reflect the status in your organization as well? Um, and the possible answers before you, yes, no, I don't know, or if perhaps you're not working in a museum at the moment, uh, then not applicable is also there. Um, but yeah, we'll give another 30 seconds or so to answer this question. Great, interesting. So um, yeah, I mean, thank you very much uh, for participating, for your replies here. Um, I think this subject is only going to grow in importance. And, um, you know, we had the feeling with this survey that we were really at, um, at a launching point, kind of on a precipice for change of our sector. So taking that status quo is very important, but uh, it's going to be key that we continue this discussion moving forward. Um, so now I would like to welcome on stage Henry McKee of Curating Tomorrow, um, who actually also contributed a fantastic introduction to the report that's uh, coming up later this month. Um, thank you again for that. Um, Henry McKee has a background as an ecologist, a museum curator and manager. He set up Curating Tomorrow in 2019 to empower museums to contribute to sustainable development agendas including the SDGs, climate action, biodiversity uh, conservation, and disaster risk reduction, as well as human rights. He is a member of the ICOM Sustainability Working Group and works internationally with museums, museum organizations, and partners. He's been involved with the UNFCCC since 2017 and was involved in the development of the Glasgow Work Program. Um, today, Miki will outline the Glasgow Work Program on Climate Action, or sorry, on Action for Climate Empowerment, and will also present a new guide on measuring and reporting greenhouse gas emissions developed in partnership with CO2 Action, a US-based greenhouse gases accounting firm. So um, without further ado, I will let you take it from here, Henny. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, if we could have the, the slides, please. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk um, about a few a few different things, but really about how do we bridge the gap between policy agendas and on the ground action, if we think about it that way, in museums and cultural institutions. And so it's been great to have the opportunity to be here with you today because we wanted to get across the idea that climate action is not just for COP. Um, which we see for uh, is on the news and uh, kind of saturates the news for about two weeks in November each year. But COP is also an extremely mysterious thing, and it's essentially it's a political pro process. We have to think that although the agreements may be made there, the action really takes place in, in small places close to home, to, to take uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's famous words, Climate empowerment, climate action takes place in communities, in schools, in museums, um, in villages, in towns, everywhere around the world. And so that's why I've put the two images here next to one another. Um, SDG 13 from the Sustainable Development Goals to take uh, urgent climate action to address climate, uh, climate change and its impacts. And to think about, uh, uh, you know, any, any small museum, because any small museum, big museum, museum organization can take part in climate action. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'd also like to emphasize that climate action and climate empowerment is not just about empowering the museum. It's about using the museum as a catalyst and a tool and a platform to empower others. And so the way that I work is that I, I write a series of um, uh, open access guides that you can get easily from either my website or from my blog uh, that circulate quite widely. And I'll, I'll just talk about some of these. So Museum Collections and Biodiversity Conservation, I wrote back in 2019 with a, a grant from the British Ecological 
society, asking uh, biodiversity uh, managers and conservationists around the world, what is it that they need from museum collections? And then you'll see that there are three guides here about the sustainable development goals and dis different aspects of them because they are an amazing framework that um, help to achieve the many different human rights conventions, agreements, environmental agreements that have been made over the last 70 years, but which are not, which are not, are not being met, Go governments are not doing enough. The Sustainable Development Goals help bring all of these together and also give us a goal-based approach to achieving them together. So much more of a inclusive process that any museum and any person can take part in. Uh, museums and disaster risk reduction sounds a bit scary, but is a, it's about a planning approach, which is about building resilience. And I wrote this in the context of the COVID pandemic and it aims to help build resilience in museums themselves, but also to, you, to, to mobilize museums to support resilience building in their communities. And of course, this relates very much to climate change. I wrote Museums and Human Rights also in 2020 um, to try to help museums understand how their activities can relate to the different human rights agreements and also how they can use human rights based approaches to make transparent, transparent and effective decisions that are not just about um, the whim of the museum, but are actually based on some kind of um, some kind of uh, rationale, some kind of framework. But the three which I'll speak mostly about today are the three in the bottom right hand side there. So I'll talk firstly about uh, mobilizing museums for climate action. Then I'll talk about action for climate empowerment with the tartan cover. And then I'll talk about measuring and reporting greenhouse gas emissions. And as I say, these are all available for, for free and we'll post the links afterwards um, on the, on the NEMO website. So let's just think about climate change and climate change is not a thing of the future. Climate change is here now. So already we have an estimated 150,000 people dying each year of climate impacts is just horrendous. And on top of that, we could think about the 7 million people who die each year from breathing polluted air, especially from burning dirty fuels in their home to, to cook with kerosene and so on. We can take the figure that a million species, and whenever you see the figure a million is a very round number, it basically means an awful lot. A million species of plants and animals at risk of extinction if climate change is not addressed. We see that climate change impacts very seriously on peace and stability. And with increasing climate impacts, the challenges get bigger. And we have the figure from the IPCC, which assesses scientific evidence on behalf of the United Nations. It has the estimate that roughly half, almost half of the world's population are highly vulnerable to climate change. These are terrible, terrible figures that we that we need to we we need to we just need to do something about. But when we talk about mitigation and adapt, adaptation, they mean particular things. And one of the challenges with climate change is that some of the language can be a bit complicated, or or it means very particular things. So climate mitigation means reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And it also means strength, strengthening nature's ability to remove them from the atmosphere. So climate mitigation usually means moving away from fossil fuel use, changing the standards and practices that we use, that, 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 that use energy, reducing waste and reducing transport use. And climate adaptation is different. It means that we have to learn to adapt to live with, with climate impacts. And we have to not just survive, we need to find ways to thrive. Now, very often these are thought of in terms of the structural options, in terms of how we modify our buildings, or they might be institutional options such as laws and policies. But really, arguably, the biggest option for climate adaptation is through education, it's through awareness raising, 
it's about, and it can also mean, um, for instance, that museums may need to move. They, they, may, they may need to, to physically move. But social options are arguably the most important aspect of climate adaptation, because if people don't want to do something, they never will. And if they don't know how to do it, they will never be able to. So these are roles that museums can play. And so here's a really simple blueprint for climate action, both in museums and with museums. So it's down to five actions, like the five fingers on your, on your hand, four fingers and a thumb. So we can think about the, those two main planks, mitigation and adaptation, but we can also think about climate action as part of wider sustainable development. So firstly, to support mitigation across society, to support those with big emissions, to reduce them. And we should also not expect those with small emissions to reduce theirs if we're not reducing our own. We should also look at museums reducing their own um, carbon emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions, at least in line with the requirements of the Paris Agreement. And these will be challenging targets to meet, but they, they need to be met. That's just that's a fact of life. We can also look at how museums can support communities and other sectors to adapt. And we can also look at how they can support nature to adapt to both current and future climate impacts. But also, museums need to have a plan for their own survival. They look after society's cultural heritage. They need to have a plan to make sure that that is protected and, and can be usable in the future. And the last one is to make sure that climate action is fair. As I mentioned before, it's just not fair to ask those who have contributed very little to do most of the work. That's just not fair. We also make, need to make sure that the climate actions are part of broader sustainable development, that they help address inequality, that they help reduce poverty. These things are because these things are very much connected. And so in the, the Mobilising Museums for Climate Action Toolkit, which we produced for COP26 a year ago, um, it sets out um, a lot of the essentials of climate change and climate action, including some background on the Paris Agreement and lots of tools in terms of sets of questions to help you plan your own action, understand where you are now, where you want to get to to understand the essential knowledge of climate impacts, mitigation and adaptation, as well as how climate change and climate action relate to human rights and what we call climate justice. It also sets out some of the different educational approaches that can support climate uh, action, such as education for sustainable development, ocean literacy, futures literacy. These are all, these are all great approaches that, that anyone can make use of. It talks about how nature can be part of the solution, but it can only ever be part of the solution. People also need to do a lot of the work. And it aims to help signpost you towards lots of the opportunities, the different tools, reports, platforms, resources to help you take uh, effective and ambitious climate action. And so this was uh, just to give you an example of how we can use museums in a slightly different way. So for COP26, a team of us um, led by Rodney Harrison and Colin, Colin Sterling, working with myself and Glasgow Science Centre, we launched a competition ahead of COP26, asking people anywhere to say, well, how can we reimagine the museum to be a place that can support climate action? And so we have a website for this with about 80 of the, the great ideas that we got from around the world. And eight of those ideas were exhibited at COP26. So the idea here comes from a team in Brazil who work with um, local communities who don't have a primarily material culture, you know, a material approach to culture. Their culture is much more rooted in oral traditions and storytelling. So they imagined very tiny and very temporary museums, not actually as tiny as this because these are, these are just models, but like a little tent, like a little yurt that could move around the community. They would they'd be made of renewable materials, sustainable materials, very low environmental impact. And there's a really nice image shown on the right hand side there that looks across from this model across to where the COP26 conference of the parties was held last year. So this is what we're trying to do is to look at the, 
to negotiate the space between policy agreements and people's lives. But let's talk about, well, what does the Paris Agreement have to do with museums anyway? Well, if we think back to the, the, the kind of the grandparent of the Paris Agreement, it's called the Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's 30 years old this year. It was one of the three uh, conventions agreed at the Rio Earth Summit. Um, and within the Framework Convention, it has an article, Article 6, which talks about the importance of education so that everyone has the knowledge, motivation and skills to take climate action. Training of crucial uh, of key members of staff so that everyone knows and is able to direct their work to contributing to, to climate action again. Public awareness of government's commitments, of local action and so on. Public access to information so that everyone can access information on the state of the environment and information to help them take climate action that they want to take. And uh, international cooperation on climate change matter. And there's one that's missing here is, is um, public participation, which is to make sure that everyone can take part in decision making uh, around climate change. And these uh, six things are what we, ca we call it Action for Climate Empowerment, ACE for short. But these six things are not j just there by accident. These The six things are there because they relate to very well established human rights. The right to education, the right to um, decent working conditions, the right to information, the right to participate in cultural life. These are all um, well established from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from, from 1948. And we have a new program to support this um, work, which was agreed in, in Glasgow last year called the Glasgow Work Programme on Action for Climate Empowerment. And it even mentions this, the important role that museums and cultural institutions can play in this work. And so I won't read through the, all of the list here, but just to, to show that there are so many ways that museums can contribute to climate action. Of course, collections are a, a, are a kind of fundamental resource that can be put to many different uses. The very many public um, opportunity, opportunities for public engagement, public education, bringing people together, uh, youth forums, how people can meet with local officials who are working on climate um, related decisions, supporting their staff, making sure their, their, um, their buildings reduce their emissions, moving to green energy and we could also say in the context of the energy crisis how they may reduce their energy use because it seems that that not not so many institutions are actually reducing their energy use how to improve insulation and energy efficiency how they can reduce waste promoting green travel both for um, visitors and for staff supporting green causes of all kinds dropping fossil fuels which are wrecking the planet prioritizing human rights and green procurement, taking up sustainable tourism as an approach, which is a, is a, whole, a whole thing. Sustainable tourism is a, is a whole thing. Making sure that they um, support green investments and, and taking part in, particip uh, in partnerships and much, much more. There are loads of ways to take climate action. We just need to perhaps um, choose a few and, and do it. And so thinking about some of the things that Elizabeth spoke about before, the findings from the NEMO survey, we already have a fantastic blueprint to help answer many of those challenges, many of those problems. And this is called the Glasgow Work Programme on Action for Climate Empowerment. So the, I wrote a guide on this. Uh, I wrote it as quick as I could after COP26 because I wanted people to be able to, to take part in it. It's got the tartan inspired cover for a bit of um, uh, cultural heritage link. So this runs from uh, 2021 till 2031. So it runs for the next nine years now. And it builds on the six aspects of action for climate empowerment that I spoke about previously. It says there are some additional things that we need. In addition to having you know, education, training, public awareness, public participation, we need four kind of priority areas of action. We need to make sure that we have effective policies that support climate action. And we can think about this in relation to the museum sector as well. So for instance, how can museum 
policies be changed so that climate action isn't a kind of add-on or a separate um, policy, but is part of the way that we think about all of our activities. Coordinated action is about saying that none of us can do this work on our own, and we need to learn really, really fast from one another. And we also are much more effective if we work together. So if there are roughly 95,000 museums in the world, imagine if all of them could use some kind of common goals, common framework, tailored to local circumstances, cultural contexts, and so on, um, local aspirations, what communities want and, and desire for their, for their own future, could be just amazing. So it's like the balance between the kind of universalism of the agreements, such as the Paris Agreement, and tailoring them to the local situation. How can we learn from one another? How can we share tools and support from uh, events such as this? And of course, organizations such as NEMO can play such a, a crucial role. And how can we make sure that any um, goals or commitments that we make are effectively talked about? Not just so that we can monitor and evaluate our activity so that we do it better next time, but so that we can hold ourselves to account and be held to account by others. So if we say we're going to do something, we should do it. But we should also tell others what we've done so that we, so that we can build some trust between museums, um, the work of um, climate action and communities so that we can be more effective in all of this work. And so just to mention quickly, uh, another a guide that I've written with a partner called CO2 Action, who are a US-based firm of carbon accountants, because one of the big challenges for museums is understanding, well, what impact do they have? How can they think about their, their emissions? Because people often get a bit confused. And so greenhouse gas accounting is a standard approach to measure and report the relevant emissions so that we can make informed decisions but it also helps us do it in a consistent way. It helps us communicate our progress and action transparently with both the successes and the challenges. And we should try to be as accurate as possible. And the reason that I, we, we wrote this is because, of course, there are many museums are measuring their emissions, but we want to go from kind of pra emerging practice to good practice. So what um, sources of emissions should be included and why? And so the guide helps to explain the principles of measuring emissions, how the three scopes and categories that make up how we, how we um, assess emissions, how they link to museum work. And it tries to give some worked examples for each of the scopes and categories, and it gives you some suggested activities to reduce your emissions. And so, for instance, we can think about the activities of a museum in terms of the energy that they use, the, um, the emissions that they produce on site, both from burning fossil fuels or from the leaks of refrigerants and so on. We can think about the emissions embodied in the goods that they purchase and make use of, the waste that they dispose of, but also to think in a, the broader sense about the impact of their operation the visitor travel, which is certainly part of a museum's emission profile, um, and so on, and where their investments go. And so the, the guide aims to try to help you understand this in a, in a concrete way. And we also were very keen that people could understand emissions from start to end. It's rather easy to get some numbers and put them into a, a spreadsheet and get a, a result at the end. But if you don't understand it, then that's, that's rather rather meaningless. We want people to, to have more confidence. And so just to summarize, what we would aim for, what would be fantastic to see, would be if you could look to reduce your emissions and help others reduce theirs. Make sure that you can adapt to climate change and help other people do the same but basically to build a world that is fairer, that protects nature and is better than the one that we inherited. And to do so, we need to work together. So 
that's the that's the end of my my presentation but if anyone wants to get in, in contact with me of course that that would be it would be, be great to hear from you so so thank you and i will close the presentation and now i have uh, two questions that i'd like to pose to you just as elizabeth did before so if we could have the first question please um, is how ambitious do you think nemo should be in support in climate action and so um It'd be great to get as many votes as possible. And by ambitious, we can think of aiming to achieve a really big result, a really focused result, a really locally relevant result, um, trying to trying to mobilize the potential of museums as much as we possibly can so that they're operating at full capacity. And NEMO as a, a museum organization, of course, has many, many opportunities to support its members and their part, current and potential partners to take part in climate action. Okay, good, thank you. And, um, and can we move to the second question, please? Okay, great. So we can see from this um, poll, perhaps not surprising, that many of you are very committed to um, contributing to climate action through your work or committed. Um, perhaps not so unsurprising that there's no one who's not committed is here because um, you wouldn't give, give your time up. But just to say as well, so people have an idea of who is, is here, we have there are over 120 people here. Uh, in fact, we have um, to near 200 people here is fantastic. Um, so to say that there are so many people who are interested in this activity, they just need to find one another. And so one of the great things that we've had through um, the, 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 uh, the terrible COVID experience is with the growth of using video conferencing and uh, webinars and so on, it's much easier to find people who are interested in the same things. As Elizabeth said, there are the different networks that, that you're encouraged to join. And if, you, if you're in an organization, you want it to do more, just ask it, tell it what, what it is that you want to do. And we'll, we can see what happens. So, so that's the end of my presentation. So thank you. And then we can move to the q and I think. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Henry, thank you so much um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, we've already had uh, quite some questions uh, flowing through the chat. Um, and I also want to mention there's also been quite some resources that have been submitted into the into the chat as well, some interesting ongoing projects. And so we are going to be collecting those links um, and sharing them with you as uh, this presentation will also be shared online later. So don't worry, that content will not just uh, disappear with the end of today. Um, but um, I would like to address some of the, the questions that came up earlier, um, and then we'll just move through. So um, go ahead and continue submitting as they come up. Um, but just perhaps um, a, a quick response to um, somewhat of a, a, a more practical direct question um, about the survey that came up um, from Mike Edson. Thank you. Um, Regarding my comment uh, about the the Nemo survey and um, that we found that uh, networks had a larger impact than size of museums when it comes to climate action. Um, so just to to clarify how we found that out, basically um, what we did um, while managing for um, the different um, number of museums that uh, had answered the survey, we went back and looked. Um, and compare the responses from uh, self-identified, you know, uh, smaller, mid-sized, and larger museums, um, and then looked at various questions, um, for example, on uh, training that was made available, on awareness of the SDGs, um, various different aspects throughout the survey. Um, and then we also looked specifically at the group of museums that, um, were involved in cultural networks focused on climate change. And then again, went back to those questions um, about, you know, training available, about awareness 
about, uh, you know, action and analysis of risks and these kinds of things to see if size made a difference, to see if um, networking made a difference. So uh, this wasn't something that uh, we just decided to say simply because we are a network. Um, this is something that we saw through the data. Um, that being said, I, I will also be transparent and say that um, it wasn't a huge amount of museums that um, self-identified as being involved in networks focused on climate change. So it was definitely a smaller subsect of, um, of the respondees. Uh, but that's also an opportunity. There's um, there's an opportunity to grow those numbers of museums that are working together because obviously it makes a difference in our confidence when we um, when we approach these massive challenges together. So <laughs> um, just just responding to that uh, technical bit. Um, there was also, however, a question um, about getting your museum involved in in this conversation, in this action. And I think in um, perhaps this was addressing uh, my presentation earlier, but I think this is something that you and I, Henry, could both respond to. Um, I think you're perhaps even more equipped to to respond to this. Um, my my um, small reply, though, would be that because, you know, you mentioned, uh, sorry, um, um, Andreas, I think I might be pronouncing your name wrong. Um, you mentioned that uh, it's not so much of a priority amongst the team right now. And so um, I imagine that that in and of itself presents quite a challenge because, you know, um, you're going at it alone. You may feel at this point, um, but you're absolutely not alone because there is a huge uh, international network that you can reach out to, I would say. So um, I I would encourage the first step being to, you know, connect with members, um, even outside of your museum, other museum professionals, um, learn how they, you know, engaged in this uh, conversation, took those first few steps, because um, I think it really helps when you do have, you know, some support behind you. Uh, but Henry, if you would like to respond to yeah, that. As sure. <clears throat> so I think for me, the, the um... Uh, what I tend to do is like I think about um, sustainable development rather than sustainability because sustainability can become a bit kind of fixated on how resources are used. Sustainable development is a bit different. Of course, it's partly how sustainable, how resources are used, but it's also much more broadly about the impacts that we make on the world. So I think what can be helpful is to... Um, gather a small number of people in your organization together who are interested in this topic, who are in different teams, and then to have a discussion about, well, where does our work make a difference? Not just thinking within the organization. So it, it might be that it's about a town or a village or a community. And then you would say, okay, well, what are the social, environmental and economic challenges there? And how do we currently help those, address those challenges? But how do we also contribute negatively towards them? Because sustainable development is about the two things. It's about how we do more of the good stuff and we reduce our negative impact. And I think by, by taking the external focus um, is, is much more effective than starting from a rather, what can be almost slightly selfish, thinking of how the, the organization can continue or, or so on. So, so get, find some other people decide on a common context and then explore what the challenges are there and how you can address them. That would be my advice. Yeah, very well said. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, I think this was uh, quite specific to your presentation, Henry. Um, we have a question from Alessandra, um, who is asking um, for some examples of scopes one, two, and three in a museum. Yeah. So, the, so um, 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 greenhouse gas emissions are mostly made up of carbon dioxide, but not only carbon dioxide. So also methane, nitrous oxide, um, and three, uh, three or four refrigerant, very powerful refrigerant gases that museums will be using in their either refrigerators or their air handling units. But we measure emissions in what are called three scopes. And the scopes depend on how much control you have over them. 
So the first scope is the production of, of emissions at your site. So either from burning oil or coal or gas um, or from the vehicles that you own and from the emissions that come out of their exhausts. That, those are scope one emissions. Scope two emissions come from the utilities that you purchase. So um, from the production of your electricity, mostly. So if you purchase your electricity from someone who is powered by windmills, that's great. If you purchase your electricity from someone who is using a coal-fired power station, that's very bad. But those are part of your emissions. Scope three is the most complicated bit. It's called the voluntary emissions, but it's most for most organisations, it's, it's most of their emissions. And so, unfortunately, for museums, um, most of their emissions, for most museums, will come from their visitor travel because visitors will have to drive and they are, or they might be international tourists and because they're in, in relatively huge numbers. So the, the three scopes help us to think about all of our activities and put them into a standard scheme. So they were developed not just for the cultural sector, but for, for any kind of organization. But there, it's a, it's a very, very solid scheme, um, but that it's explained more in, in, the, in that guide that I mentioned. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm trying to also keep track of the incoming questions. Um, but uh, yes, thank you for a bit of the detailed examples of the different scopes, because sometimes, um, you know, with all the numbers flying around, it is kind of difficult to keep track of what we're actually talking about. Um, so we have another question here about uh, connecting and combining climate with social sustainability in museums, um, how, how best to do that. Um, I, I think this is uh, something perhaps we can both um, uh, respond to. Um, I think, I mean, well, I think we can both respond to it, but we probably won't uh, cover everything because I feel that there are so many opportunities. Um, and in fact, uh, I think, as I said in earlier in, in the in the presentation, while our survey focused on um, ecological components, um, uh, in reality, a true sustainable transition for the sector um, is going to involve a lot more than that. It is also going to involve social sustainability um, and uh, support for our communities. Um, uh, just a few things uh, that come to mind, um, you know, because we are very often talking about uh, engagement um, with audiences and education. And um, in that regard, I think uh, making connections between uh, colonialism and climate change, capitalism, um, you know, just uh, the systemic structures involved, I think uh, making those links is, um, is a great opportunity. I think, uh, as mentioned earlier as well, um, supporting uh, dignified, sustainable work um, opportunities, um, incorporating more diverse experiences, um, and also just, uh, you know, as Henry was mentioning earlier, taking, you know, uh, a localized focus and finding out what, uh, what forms of support is uh, going to be necessary in the community that the museum is within. Um, but these are just some of the, the links that come to mind for me when we're talking about climate and, and the social section and uh, what museums can do or, yeah. But uh, Henry, if, if you want to also respond to that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because, um, I mean, one of the, the common kind of mis misconceptions that people have is that the Paris Agreement is an environmental agreement. That's partly true, but it's really a social justice agreement. It's about very, you know, the, the, the climate change is a huge problem but it's a symptom of a much deeper and much more sinister problem, which is about a basically very unequal, totally unsustainable use of the of our shared um, uh, natural heritage. And so, as I mentioned in the the action for climate empowerment, you know, it, it includes the six things: education, training, public awareness, and so on. That these are human rights. But one of the big problems we have. One, people hardly even know what human rights they have. Two, consequently, we're never going to get them. And three, the institutions who could be supporting people with their rights, 
are rather unaware even what the rights are that we're talking about. And we unfortunately, we could include museums in this, that when, you know, this program is 30 years old, even when the last iteration of the International Council of Museums Code of Ethics was done, which I think is in 2002, it still talked about a rather narrow set of interests for museums, which were about cultural heritage and copyright and a few other things. So museums are quite be behind, but they're not unique in this. You know, lots of sectors are behind. So rights-based approaches are a really fantastic tool because they're about acknowledging people have rights, that institutions that can support those rights should really fulfill that public duty. And that's actually how the institutions will be more effective. And so I think this is one of the ways that we can think of climate, environmental justice, and social justice as really parts of the same, the same thing. And as it says in the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, we, we can't just think about these problems as being like separate boxes, you know, an environmental topic and a social topic. We see that with, with COVID, that these things are so tightly connected together. We have to always be thinking about the social, environmental and economic conditions together. So that would be my answer. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think uh, what you said about um, taking the human rights approach, um, I think that's extremely important, but also an opportunity perhaps for um, for individuals um, who maybe are having a hard time um, bringing forward the relevance into their institutions, because I mean, simply the, the different framework, the different perspective, um, which is still e extremely valid, um, could, uh, could perhaps be really helpful. And um, also, I, I think uh, I would like to also underline um, what you said as well about um, this being a, a symptom of a much larger problem, because um, I believe earlier, um, I've lost it now in the chat, but um, earlier, I believe it was from Johanna Leisner, um, who um, was the main researcher for the wonderful OMC report that uh, came out earlier this year, which I highly recommend to everyone here. Um, commented on the need to be focusing on you know the the cause um the uh the emissions the the oil and gas companies um really we are facing such a massive need to um make systemic change systemic changes in our society so um it's uh it's quite a task in front of us but um as you said earlier it is simply a fact of life that it is something we need to do and we need to do together so <laughs> Yeah, um, with that, uh, we are just a couple minutes over. So um, I would like to thank you so much for taking the time with us today, Henry. Um, it's always such a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you all as well, everyone, uh, for joining us. Um, we, yeah, we hope to see you again, uh, again soon. So yeah, with that, um, thank you so much. <laughs> Have a good afternoon. Good luck with your climate action, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming.